Good morning. Perfect timing. Um, I'm excited about today because lasers are why I like, chose the graduate group research group that I chose. So I went on a tour and, you know, as you get closer to your graduation date, if you're thinking about going to grad school, it's really a magical time. You get to go and visit the schools and, and they want you to come there. They're recruiting you. So you visit with the faculty, you visit with the grad students, you go around and tour two or three labs. And I, I went to uh, Dr. Nibbler's lab, Joseph Nibbler at Oregon State, and it was green laser light flashing everywhere and electronics and laser tables and everything. And I was just amazed. I thought this was fantastic. And so whenever we get to this part of electronic spectroscopy, I always get excited because I just love lasers. So we'll dive, dive in to see what's going on with lasers. So we've seen a couple of spectra. This is the lower one is the one we did uh, during the atomic spectroscopy lecture, and that's the emission spectrum of the sun. And it's a continuum. There are certain lines, the Fraunhofer lines that are dips that would be atomic uh, absorption lines. But in general, you have light at all the wavelengths. And so we call that a continuum. And the thing that uh, was difficult to understand in terms of classical physics was not the continuum part. It was that it went, the, that the uh, energy went back down uh, at short wavelengths. That was the UV catastrophe. And that it was a function of temperature, not the material. So you would get a, a profile of light, a continuum of light, off of any hot object. And it didn't matter if it was copper or steel or anything like that. So it was strange. It was something weird about that, that it didn't matter what material was emitting the light. It was just a function of the, of the temperature. So those were a couple of things that led to the quantum mechanics, as we talked about. But then line spectra also weren't explainable. We talked about the hydrogen spectrum. And lasers, we get these atomic lines, and there are molecular lasers too, but you know, this is the helium neon laser line. And so you can see there is no other light being emitted in that spectrum until you get to the laser line, and then you see this sh sharp line. It's incredibly bright spectrally. So we say it's got high spectral brightness because at that wavelength, it's incredibly bright, and then at other wavelengths, it's essentially zero. So that's, that's the beauty of a laser because um, if you have, say, a one watt source that's spread over all of these wavelengths, at any given wavelength, it's, it's a milliwatt. You know, it's a tiny little bit of energy per second. But if you have a one watt laser, all of that energy is in one narrow line. And so there's an enormous amount of power in lasers at that particular wavelength. And so you can get these lasers in all the different colors. Um, we'll see how that, that, that works. But, but if you're looking at, uh, say, the electron cloud, it has these standing waves. There's a particular uh, energy transition. And if you can get the cavity to be resonant with that energy difference, then you can get just that particular transition to be the only one that's really stable in that cavity. So the laser has a lasing medium. That's the thing that has the atom or the molecule or the crystal in it. And then it's got a resonant cavity. So there's two things that need to happen for a laser. You have to have the, the lasing medium and then you have to have the resonant cavity that builds up those standing waves of light. So that's really what today's lecture is about, is trying to figure out what kind of energetic energy level system do we need to create the lasing medium. And then we'll talk about the resonant cavity a little bit. Okay, just always fun with lasers too, at least different means. I, mean, I love this one, don't chase the laser Carl. <laughs> you got a hold of him. Okay, and, uh, and you've seen all of the little, you know, spy shows where they do backflips and everything through the lasers. So that's great. Okay, so let's look at this in terms of the Javonsky diagram. Um, I don't know of any phosphorescent lasers because that's a, a slope process. So most of the lasers are fluorescent in some manner. So, so it's the fluorescence that gives us the lasing signal. Fluorescence in a resonant cavity. So what is a cavity? Well, it's essentially between two mirrors. <laughs> so you put the lasing medium between two mirrors and you build up that, that light, the light intensity. And so here's the energy level diagram for the 
neodymium YAG laser. This has become the probably the most inexpensive laser. If not, if not, the helium neon may break be, uh, beat it out. But these little diode lasers are uh, are really becoming popular. So this is neodymium. That's the that's the atom that's giving us this particular energy level diagram. Okay. Now they used to make gas lasers, and they still do. They have argon lasers and so on. So the gas is the lasing medium in between the mirrors and the resonant cavity. But it's just much more robust if you can put that the the atom neodymium in a crystal. So they'll grow this garnet crystal. So this is G stands for garnet. And so that's a particular crystal. And the, the type of garnet contains yttrium and aluminum. So an ND YAG laser, all those things actually mean something. The neodymium is the lasing medium or the lasing atom, and the yttrium aluminum garnet crystal is the matrix that the, that the neodymium is in. So they just mix this up. If you do uh, research for Dr. Trad, he does a lot of solid state chemistry where you mix up, grind up the, the bits, put them together, and then warm it up, and it will rearrange and make a crystal structure or the different nanodots that he's trying to make. Uh, these guys put all of their ground up powders into a, a crucible. They heat that crucible with um, typically radio frequency or inductive heating, you get an extremely high temperature, and it melts all of that substance together. Then they come in with a seed crystal from a really good um, previous growth, and they touch that to the surface, and those atoms will attach to that seed crystal in the in the in like a single crystal manner, and they'll slowly draw it out of that molten uh, soup, and, and it'll make a perfect crystal. And the neodymium, uh, will dope and, and, and replace yttrium in this aluminum garnet crystal. And so it will um, sort of be a neodymium atom here and then surrounded by the regular crystal matrix and then another neodymium atom and then another one. And so each of those neodymium atoms is in almost an identical chemical environment. So that means those energy levels are, are the same for all of those neodymium atoms. And that's really good because that's what gives you a high quality lasing medium. So light comes in and excites a neodymium atom and it goes up. So it's, it's pumped by light and it's got fast relaxation to this metastable state. Okay. And then this, uh, this right here, this slow is just indicating that the lifetime or the radiative lifetime for this drop here is fast. And this one is slower. It's all just, it's just straight up. Uh, statistics based upon the the, um, the transition dipole moment integrals that this one is a is a like a weaker peak or a, a slower transition or a less probable transition than this one and this one. So another photon of light comes in, excites another neodymium atom. Another photon comes in, excites another one, and it bounces back with say Rayleigh scattering. Okay, so you have all of those spectroscopic uh, events happening. Then another one gets excited ends up in that state then maybe one of those drops down by that time and goes back to the bottom and then another one comes up and then another one comes up we're hitting this crystal with enormous amount of light so there's a lot of absorption so that's why we call it a pump we're just pumping these atoms up to the excited state and if you'll notice we always have because this is a four level system this this level is empty and we have a lot of atoms in this level. And so what happens next is a spontaneous drop in one of those photon or one of those atoms and it spits out a photon. And that stimulates the emission of the second one and the third one and the fourth one. So there's an enormous cascade. Now, whenever you have stimulated emission, you get a second photon in phase with the first. So notice these are all in phase. So I'm writing all stimulated photons are in phase. 
with each other. Another word for that is called coherent. So lasers emit coherent light. It's a, if in a, in a wave model, it's a single wave with an enormous amplitude. Okay, if you're thinking of a particle model, these photons come out and the photons all have, so it's lots of photons with the same wave properties in phase with each other. But if they're in phase, if you just look at the cosine, it's just a cosine with an enormous amplitude. Okay. And so let's, um, let's look at the mechanics down here. When I talked about pumping with visible light, um, if we take this elliptical reflector, do you know, have you ever made an ellipse? This is like a little childhood project. You have two pins in the, in the paper, you put a loop of string around it, and you have the pencil and you just follow, let that string, you pull the string tight and you go around both pins and it makes an ellipse. And the two pins are the focal points of that ellipse. So an ellipse has two focal points. It's like you took um, two parabolas and merged them together. Cause like a parabola has a focal point and the other parabola has a focal point, but it's a little different shape, but still an ellipse has two focal points. So think about that. If we put a bright, flash lamp here in this focal point and we put the neodymium YAG crystal in the other focal point, all the light coming out of our flash lamp hits the crystal. That's really efficient and that's a great way to pump these things and that's the way our um, resonant cavity was in, in the lasers that I worked with uh, in graduate school and it, it generated this light would heat up this this aluminum block because so many photons of light some probability of those would be absorbed by the aluminum and especially in the uv and it would heat up so we ran high purity water through here and this was a high voltage flash lamp so basically a lightning strike between these two um, electrodes and all that light would go into the crystal and pump up those neodymium atoms um, we needed a high powered uh, power supply and it was a water cooled system. So there was water involved. So you had high uh, voltage electronics and water in the same box, <laughs> which is always a risk because things would leak and it was a real frustrating thing. Um, it would blow fuses all the time. And uh, so whenever you open up that cabinet, it really had a, a true warning. A lot of times these warnings seem to be bogus, but this one was true. It said high voltage, you know, and it, and it said capacitors contain a lethal charge. So even if you unplug from the wall, the capacitors that were charged up to create this lightning strike um, contained enough uh, charge that they would generate a deadly current if you touch both poles. So the, the uh, hazing that was in our lab, whenever this thing needed to be opened up, was you were the person that got to ground out the, the capacitors. So we had a screwdriver and they said, okay, go in there, you put your glasses on, right? Go in there and touch both poles with the screwdriver and short out the capacitor so we can be safe to go into the box. And so, um, so you put your glasses on and you stick it in there. Now it should have been a clue that the end of the screwdriver was all melted off. <laughs> like there was no like the flat part of the screwdriver was gone okay so you stick it in there and sure enough you touch it and it sounded like a shotgun going off Pow! and there was always a you know like a maybe not a dent but it felt like there should be a dent because you go in there bam you hit the back of your head on the top of the box and everybody laughs and you laugh because you're not dead and so it's always fun and and so then the next guy comes along we're like, hey time to short out the capacitors um we didn't have to do that a lot but it was it was kind of a rite of passage so a uh, diode laser is so much better than this, but it's not as powerful, okay? So a diode laser is the kind of thing that you have for your, um, you know, for your laser pointers, no water cool, no high voltage, portable, it's all fantastic. So, uh, but if you need high powered laser, sometimes you need things like this. So it just depends upon the application. So this uh, neodymium energy system, these energy levels, uh, are going, they're right in here in this rod. And then this is the resonant cavity. See this back mirror and this front mirror? So this is the resonant cavity. And it is a geometric adjustment. So you get those mirrors close 
to what you think is a multiple of the wavelengths of light. And uh, in this particular system, the wavelength of light is uh, 1,064 microns. So that's pretty small. We could, we could adjust those mirrors by, as long as they adjust by one micron, you're gonna find the spot that has an integer multiple of waves between these two mirrors. So it's, it's just like tuning a piano. <laughs> you have uh, lots of different wavelengths coming out of this and you adjust it and all of a sudden it coalesces into one standing wave between those mirrors that has maybe a, you know, a couple of million waves, but it's exactly you know, one million waves between those mirrors and the brightness just jumps up an enormous amount. So there's, there's the laser classifications. I got my magnifying glass out and read this one. It's so small you can't see it. Maybe you guys can. But it's a class two laser. So don't stare into the beam. But if this thing hits you in the eye, it's not gonna it's not gonna blind you, but it's mildly irritating, you know. So yeah. So it's mildly irritating. Um, I did that to the laser safety person at Pantex and they freaked out. Okay. So, it's a government facility and they were really mad because I had bought a laser and didn't get it cleared with the paperwork and everything. And I said, it's mildly irritating. You know? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, class one is safe for all uses. Those are, you know, this is a pretty bright one. This is a class two, okay? And it was mildly irritating. Uh, then class one M, don't view it with a magnifier. Obviously don't view this with a magnifier. Anything below sort of carries with it that, um, uh, previous warnings. And so then class 3R, we're talking about now 5 milliwatts. And that doesn't sound like a lot. But remember, all five of those milliwatts are in a very narrow spectral region. Um, avoid direct eye exposure. So I wouldn't do that with uh, class 3 uh, of any type. Um, class 3B has, you know, it gets up to where it might damage skin. And so we definitely had a class 4 laser in our research lab in, in Oregon. Uh, remember I said that the neodymium YAG wavelength was uh, 1064 microns. That's in the infrared region, so you can't see the laser. And that's a problem for safety, right? We had a couple of laser tables that, that were joined together. So one laser was on this table, another laser was on that table. We joined those beams together and did our research with it. And so between these two lasers was a pulsed laser beam at, in the infrared region that you couldn't see. And we had a, a visitor in the lab. We should have um, told him, you know, stay on the outside because he walked between the two laser tables and got popped three times through his shirt and he looked like cigarette burns. Yeah. He walked through the between the tables and he starts screaming, ow, 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 while we were saying, don't do that. <laughs> and so he was like, what the heck? You know, didn't say heck, but <laughs> and he said, what, are you okay? And he lifted up his shirt and he had these three spots on his, on his waist. Yeah. So we later put then a PVC pipe and bolted it down between the, the two tables because of that accident. And so you couldn't walk through there. Just So it just was this PVC pipe that just acted as a barrier. So you couldn't break the beam. The other thing, too, is whenever you walk into, if you ever go into a laser lab, um, uh, you know, there should be warnings on the door and everything. But the good practice, if you walk in, is turn towards the wall because you want to see if there's any damage on the wall at eye level, okay? And if there are any, like, if it's a visible laser, you'll see it on the wall. And so if you're walking into a lab and you see on the wall right here, you see the laser beam, do not turn and look at, <laughs> where's that coming from? <laughs> right? You get it right in the face. So, you know, or do this with your hands. You're like, okay, there's a laser beam right here. I'm not going to turn and look at the table i was like i would say to the person uh, do i need to leave or can you shut that off <laughs> you know and so just basic laser safety the other thing is laser goggles so we have different laser goggles so these are specific to certain wavelengths of light i think this one is 785 nanometer light but anyway they're nice yeah so they've got um these are kind of a I don't know what you would call that maroon color. Yeah, makes me feel like an Aggie. Everything's maroon. And so, um, you know, if you have a blue laser, then then red goggles are typical. So this would be for blue lasers and green lasers. Um, there's a 
tendency to want to go for a general, like, let's just darken everything. But if you, this would probably not block very much laser light because it's still uh, very lightly smoked, okay? But for some of these laser powers, if you really want to get it, get it down to eye safe levels, le levels, then the glasses are almost opaque. So it's a real safety issue. Do I be eye safe for the laser and then I can't see anything and I stick my hand in a beam? You know, so that's, so it's sort of this tension between being eye safe and, and, and being physically safe with what you're, what you're touching. So uh, it's better to go ahead and spend the extra money to get goggles that are for your particular wavelengths. So these will have uh, specific layers called interference filters that are tuned for that, that wavelength of light and it will stop it. But it's expensive because you're buying this for every kind of laser that you have. So there would be a set goggle for a high powered neodymium YAG laser that wouldn't work for a helium neon laser and vice versa. So. Uh, while we're talking about this, so I had a student give me this laser. Uh, he took this out of a Blu-ray player and I'm actually gonna put these, these on here. Um, and I'm not gonna show it, shine it towards you guys, but I'm gonna shine it on the screen here. That's not eye safe. See how bright it is? Just, um, you put a little lens here. And I've put it on paper before, and it's, it's kind of burned the paper a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not. This morning, I couldn't get it to work. I think the battery is a little weak. It might have been brown paper that I got it to burn. But, but anyway, this is not an eye safe laser. Um, and I said, are you sure you want to keep that? And he said, you can have it. <laughs> he said, it's pretty dangerous. <laughs> so, so I said, OK, I'll keep it. I'll use it for demonstrations in class. So, you know, sometimes when they come up with new technology, they kind of go overkill on the technology until they tune it just right. And so these old Blu-ray players have pretty powerful blue lasers in them. And so that's, that's crazy. This is the laser for the Raman lab. And this is a neodymium YAG laser. Um, the diode laser is probably not much bigger than this, okay? But for spectroscopy, we want it to be stable. And so there's a pretty hefty power supply in here that gives it just beautifully stable power. And so you don't have it blinking or jiggling in terms of its... Uh, actually, probably wouldn't change frequency. Uh, that's going to be a temperature effect. So the dimensions of the crystal will change when it warms up, and that'll shift the frequency a little bit. Uh, but then once it's warmed up, it'll be stable, and you have the same wavelength for hours and hours, maybe even days. It's pretty heavy because of the heat sink. Okay. So let's talk about some types of lasers. This is the one of the first lasers, <clears throat> if not the first, is the Ruby laser. So what is Ruby? Well, Ruby is a sapphire crystal with chromium atoms doped into it. And so a sapphire crystal is just, if you make a sapphire crystal without any of the um, transition metals doped into it, then it's just a clear crystal, which is really sad because we had sapphire windows in the infrared and I was like, I love sapphires because typically sapphires are blue, right? Well, it's blue if you have titanium doped into it. If you have chromium doped into it, it's ruby. So a ruby and a sapphire are the same crystal. They just have different uh, transition metals doped into them. And so if they grow this beautiful ruby crystal with a little bit of, uh, of uh, the um, chromium doped into it, and then they, they use that uh, silver aldehyde uh, Tollens test to make a mirror on the backside. And so they'll precipitate out or reduce silver to the outside and they'll mirror the backside so that it reflects the light. And then they have a partially silvered mirror in front that lets some of the light leak out. Then they have that resonant cavity. And then they make a, they made a, the first laser that they made had a really well done glass blown coil uh, for the flash lamp with the bulky water cooled power supply. And so this is the Ruby crystal. So they had an enormously powerful pump that would pump those chromium atoms up here. Then we would get the population inversion. And that's the thing that's, um, that's required is this population inversion is required to have a, a laser actually work because it's the stimulation it's the laser is light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation that's it's an actually an, an initialism 
And if you don't have that population inversion, then you have more absorption than you have emission. And so you have to get it backwards. You have to get more in the top level than the bottom level so that you have more emission than absorption. Because emission and absorption have the same transition dipole moment integral. They have the same probability. So you've got to get more in the excited state than in the ground state. Well, let's talk about the, the resonant cavity. <clears throat> if we're pumping this light up and it's spontaneously emitting and then it's, it's sort of lasing too soon, then, then we, we don't get as high power as we'd like. And so this thing is called a Q switch. And let's, um, I'm gonna go ahead and expand this, okay. Yeah, so let's, let's draw it like this. It's like a little block that has two materials in them. And and if light, let's see. So we have a thing that, that will rotate the polarization of the light a quarter of a wave. So it'll rotate at one quarter, so at 45 degrees when it goes through, and then it bounces off the front mirror, and then it rotates at another 45 degrees. And so it's taken the light as it passes through this crystal twice. It's taken it, say, from vertical to horizontal polarization. And if the output, let me try to think, if the output is vertical only, So one way to create this output coupler is to have it only pass half the light. So it's, it's, it passes, um, say, vertically polarized light. So if I can get light to go horizontal, then it'll be blocked and, and, and won't reflect back as well. And so what we do is we play with the polarization of light so that we don't have a resonant cavity yet. So we're mixing the polarization. Things can't be in... in uh, uh, in phase with each other and we're not building up this resonant cavity, but we are building up the population inversion. So we get the population inversion, it could immediately laze, but we don't want that. And so we, anything that happens spontaneously, we essentially rotate out of the cavity. And then it's building and building and building. So we can get, you know, millions more atoms in the excited state so that when we turn this Q switch, uh, on, I guess, for the light, but we really turn the switch off because it's blocking the light we don't want, then everything cascades down, okay? I'm trying to think of, uh, of an analogy. A lot of this works with water. You know, if you, um, you know, think of trying to fill a funnel. <clears throat> You're filling a funnel up above you, but it's dripping out. The Q switch pinches the bottom of the funnel until it really fills up. And then you turn it, then you open it up, and then it all comes out faster. You know, if you try to fill a funnel, you put water up there, it might fill a little bit, but it's leaking out about as fast as it fills. But the Q switch pinches off the bottom and lets it fill up, and then you let go, and it, and it all comes out. Um, we can take that resonant cavity and actually build a crystal with a resonant cavity in it. And this is how the, the diode lasers work. So this photo is from just, that site's pretty funny. It's kind of, I don't know why they called it this, but it's the Britney Spears Guide to Semiconductor Physics. <laughs> <I don't, laughs> it's a great site though, good explanations. And so this is a, the diode laser and in the front and back of the crystal are the resonant cavity. So they'll put a different mirrored surface on there and uh, it will it will set itself up. Nice thing about these is they're solid state, they're uh, air cooled, that's what's going on in this box here. So this is an amazing facility and, a, and it's a exercise and probably the greatest contrasts because this site goes from this tiny little diode laser right here, which the penny is shown for scale, okay? So it's a, a well-constructed diode laser 
and it takes the signal that comes out of that diode laser and runs it through this football field sized amplification chamber and does fusion with it. So this is the world's most powerful laser. And, uh, you know, for scale, here's the little worker guys here. Okay. So yeah, this building is the size of a football field and it's a, it's one laser as a, and so I've got, um, some videos we can watch. So this one is a good one. I'll do this one because it's a, it's a more recent video and they have a, a voiceover on the Beamline tour. So. so this is Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And let me swap this over so I can see the browser. Let's see. Okay, and let's turn that on. Yeah, there we are. Okay. And let me turn on desktop audio. Hmm. It's not very loud. Ah, there we go. Alright. Troops from around the globe for experiments that can't be conducted anywhere else on Earth. Let's take a closer look. Here inside this clean room, engineering technicians use mechatronics to fabricate targets for NIC experiments, called shots. While target designs vary significantly across different experimental campaigns, their extreme precision is a common entry. Here we see a hall room. A metal canister about the size of a dime, which will house a cryogenically frozen fuel capsule the size of a peppercorn. Targets like this are designed to help physicists answer specific questions about how matter behaves in extreme conditions. He's using a lot of euphemisms. They're studying fusion research. <laughs> okay, so this peppercorn size thing is, is lithium de and deuterium, a lithium deuteride crystal, uh, which again will experience a fusion reaction. And, and make a couple of helium atoms. And so it's, you know, you can make a helium from two hydrogens and that releases an enormous amount of uh, energy, really two deuterium atoms. But then there's also a reaction between lithium and deuterium. Okay. The goal, improve our understanding of the universe and ensure the nation's nuclear stockpile. Once these intricate targets are complete, they will be positioned at the center of this 10 meter diameter target chamber. Welcome to the target bay, which contains the this. Do you hear the target chainer? 10 meters in diameter. So let's see, that's that's bigger than this room, I think. Yeah, I don't think it's 10 meters from, from front to back. It might be close. Okay. So. This is a, oh, sorry. A MIPS 192 laser books. You may recognize this view from the film Star Trek Into Darkness where this target chamber served as the war core of the Starship Enterprise. Here, operations manager Bruno Van Wattergem points out some of the 60 X-ray, optical, and nuclear diagnostics used to give researchers a view into what happens with each experiment. For today's shot, researchers are particularly interested in measuring the opacity of hot, dense plasma, similar to that found surrounding neutron stars. So what they do is they have uh, spectrometers aimed at the shot. So the laser comes in and blows up the sample. And then they're looking to see what kind of gamma rays are emitted. Um, they send x-rays through the plasma in the few nanoseconds that it exists to try to do diagnostics on it um, to learn more about this fusion reaction. Like, like, how do you know what is the exact pressure that you need to create fusion? How fast does it fizzle out you know you know what's what's the lifetime of it and so on what kind of pressures were achieved with this laser shot and so this is some of the the research that's being done here um, in the past we could create fusion in a sort of a runaway manner and it's called a thermonuclear bomb and they would do research on those too because the gamma rays would come out at the speed of light 
and then the shock wave would happen. And so they would have gamma ray spectrometers and X-ray spectrometers in these sight tubes, and they would detonate a nuclear weapon and get all of the data that's traveling as fast as the speed of light right before those instruments were destroyed by the shockwave. <laughs> so it's kind of sad. You make these beautiful, precise spectrometers, put them right next to a nuclear weapon, detonate it, get all the data, and then have to build everything again. You got to rebuild the spectrometers and all of that. So uh, pretty expensive, but, but amazing research. The NIMS shock director and the team of systems engineers prepared for a shock. NIMS complex operation, alignment, and diagnostic functions are controlled and orchestrated by the integrated computer control system, which consists of 66,000 control points and 3.5 million lines of code. The control group must coordinate all systems involved in depositing nearly 2 million joules of lakes of energy to the level. And it's almost time for action. Four, three, two, one, shot. Once the countdown reaches zero, a single weak pulse of light is generated. That pulse is split and routed through 192 separate beam lines that you see here in the NIF laser bay. The beams pass through nearly 40,000 optics as they course back and forth through amplifiers and conditioners in these beam lines. All told, a beam will travel about 1,500 meters in a few millionths of a second, increasing in energy by a factor of 8 million billion before its final approach to target This before is target cool. Target the beams are aligned to surround the target. You see how all of those beams split up into different directions? And the thing is, they have to hit the target at exactly the same time. So they have to be exactly the same length path, even though they're going up and down and around. And so there's a lot of tortured paths uh, to get them all to be exactly the same length, and they go in. Now, this is all still infrared light. It's the neodymium YAG line of 1064. They double that, which means cuts the wavelength in half. So that's 532. That's the green, familiar green line that you see in green laser pointers and so on. And then they cut that in half again, which again would be uh, 52. What is it? One half of 532. Um, 250, 60, 266. Yeah, 266. And so it's a 266 way, uh, uh, nanometer light that actually hits the target. Okay. Converted into ultraviolet light and focus down to a point. The beams converge on the interior surface of the hull. That's the inside of the shot uh, chamber. As the capsule's plastic shell burns off, it creates a rocket effect, accelerating the fuel capsule inwards at about 370 kilometers per second. The heavy hydrogen fuel inside is compressed to temperatures that reach 100 million degrees Celsius. 100 million degrees. Yeah. There's a Sandia site that wants to do fusion as well with the magnetic confinement. And they're trying to get to, I think their last record was 1.6 million degrees. And this is even more. Um, notice the, the timer down here. It's five billionths of a second, so nanoseconds. This shot is really short, but it's an enormous amount of energy in a, such a short period of time. And and you'll see it starts to burn off the the outer shell and that creates a, a compressive effect. So think about Newton's laws, right? Any reaction has an equal and opposite reaction. And so as the, the surface leaves, it's sort of jumping off the surface, right? If you jump off the surface, you're putting a force down. Um, and so it's compressing the cell. So as they burn off the surface, they compress the inner core. And to the and they get fusion, so that's how it works. Six times hotter than the sun, in 100 billion atmospheres, pressures higher than the center of gas giant planets like Jupiter. As the fuel is compressed, the hydrogen atoms begin to fuse together into helium, releasing a tremendous burst of fusion energy, the energy source that powers stars and our sun. 100 billion atmospheres. This is one of more than 400 scheduled to take place this year and if. 
It is a truly one-of-a-kind research community that draws on the expertise of dozens of disciplines. The net result is unparalleled insight into some of nature's most enigmatic nuclear and astrophysical phenomena. And so they're trying to recruit you, of course. Your career is at LLNL. <laughs> so, you know, computer programmers, uh, you know, physical chemists, optics people, um, microscopists working in the little whole realm lab. It's a great place. So they don't pay me to recruit, but it's just be an amazing place to work. Let's go back here. Let's see. Okay, so that's the largest laser. If you um, go to these different sites uh, that you see in your notes, you can ride the beam line. It takes you all the way down, like with an animation where you go through the amplifiers and stuff. Um, and then they achieve 1.3 megajoules. So, like I said, what is, uh, in terms of watts, what is that? So that's 1.3 times 10 to the sixth joules, okay? And it was, what we see on that little counter, was it like 20 billionths of a second, 20 nanoseconds? It was It was counting up, it got close to 20, so let's just say 20. Um, so joules per second is watts, okay? So somebody pull your calculator out and let's calculate what this is in terms of watts. Okay. And this would be time average power is what they calculate. So that's going to be six and a half, 6.5 times 10 to the 13 watts. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, a whole power plant might be um, uh, like the Fayette County coal-fired power plant is around 450 megawatts. So <laughs> it's only 450 million watts. So this is way more power, but it's only for 20 nanoseconds, <laughs> okay? but. They can, they can, you know, get 65 quadrillion watts for 20 nanoseconds. And they did announce positive energy balance a few years back, which means that they got more energy out. Uh, so they got, they put in say 1.3 million joules and they got more of those joules out from the fusion reaction. So we are, we are learning how to do fusion. We know how to do fusion, but we can't control it. Like we can make a thermonuclear bomb, that's fusion, but it's so destructive. How do we turn that into power, right? That's the question and control it. And so this is one of the ways they're actually doing controlled fusion here, uh, but it's just not enough. Uh, it only lasts for 20 nanoseconds, really only 10. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so here's some, uh, the the most common lasers. We have the sapphire laser, the neodymium YAG laser, the helium neon laser. This one is really bizarre. If you were to tell me that this was the scheme you were going to use to make a laser, I would tell you, I don't believe that'll work. Because <laughs> what you do is we actually excite the helium atom. So the pump is here that excites the helium. Okay, so helium is up in its singlet S or triplet S state. And then it collides with the neon atom and transfers that energy to the neon atom. And then the energy in the neon atom has a, has a population inversion. So it excites the neon atoms. And then this has zero population. And that's enough to create a laser. All you need is that population inversion and you put it in a resonant cavity and, and you can tune that cavity to get to get the, the, the laser to, to happen. Now, in this particular laser, it's a gas laser, so you need a, a decent, I mean, you need a fine control of the proportion of helium and neon because you need that, you know, collisional probability to be just so. And so that's, 
that's the um but this seems really complicated um it gives off a 1, 1. 1.2 micron line and then a 632 nanometer line and that's in the visible region in the red okay but it can be pretty intense you can make a pretty intense helium neon laser uh, the neodymium mag laser the population inversion occurs between these levels So it has near zero population in this um, level. It's pretty close to the ground state, so you might have some thermal population, maybe, but uh, but you get that population inversion with a good pump. You, it's easy to set up a neodymium YAG laser. You can get uh, population inversion with just a modest amount of voltage um, and, and current through this through a, like a, a diode that has neodymium in it. And in this one, you need a really intense pump because the ground state, it has to have a population inversion uh, against the ground state. So do you know why I'm writing difficult on that one? Because the ground state is the ground state. It's going to be the natural state for all of those atoms. So to get a population inversion against the ground state, you have to have a super intense pump. You have to dump as much light into that crystal as possible to get those atoms excited, more so than to be in the ground state. And so once you get that, then it'll laze, but you've got to keep that light pumping those atoms up. And then here's all the different kinds of wavelengths that you can get a laser in. We have some UV lasers, we have far infrared lasers and so on. And then there's some more exciting things. These UV lasers uh, can be used to knock things out of the sky. Now this exaplex, let me just, don't leave yet, we got one minute. The exaplex or eczema lasers have a guaranteed population inversion. That's, that line's not on your notes, so make sure that you write that. It's a guaranteed population inversion because the ground state or the ground electronic state d is dissociative. So there cannot be any molecules in the ground state. So these are also called chemical lasers. A chemical reaction between these two complexes forms an excited state dimer or an excited state complex. And then when they spit out light, they dissociate. And then they come back together in an excited state with an electronic excitation or something, and then they make an excited state dimer, and then they emit light and dissociate. So the ground state's dissociative, so there aren't any ground state complexes. These only exist in the excited state. And we use this to knock things out of the sky. <laughs> so we put these on planes for missile defense. So a boost phase, a missile comes off of a out of a hostile location we can shoot that thing down with one of these lasers missiles coming towards ships they have this in the navy you can shoot the missiles down the nice thing about it is it travels at the speed of light bullets do not and so you can sit and focus on the on the canister of that missile and heat it up until it blows up uh, most of these things have explosives on board because that's why they're being shot at you and so you can heat those explosives up until they cook off and destroy the object on a more um Local note, we have a lot of people that are under these exaplex lasers to shape the cornea and the tissue underneath the corneal flap. And so that's how LASIK eye surgery works. And the computer controls the laser. So up here is the person's eye and the laser will go in there and blast the cornea. And it's pretty creepy to watch. I watched my wife's LASIK surgery and uh, and the computer, he puts some dots, like with a Sharpie, medical Sharpie, on the eye, and the computer locks onto those dots. So even though her eye is moving around, the computer and the laser are moving with her eye. And so it's really cool. So on the computer view, the eye's not moving. But then on the live camera view, her eye's twitching around, and the computer's able to track with it. And I said, is the, how, you know, how fast will the eye move where the computer can't track? And he says, a sneeze. So he says, but the computer can track, if it lose track of the eye, it won't shoot the laser. So it's tracking, and if as long as it, the electronics are fast enough, as long as it's on track, it can shoot the laser. But if it falls off track, then it, then it doesn't. And then he had a crosshatch area up here. I said, what's that? And he said, that's the flap hinge, and I don't want the laser to shoot that because the flap will come off. And so this guy was great. He was telling me all about it while my wife's eye is getting blasted with this laser. <laughs> and so it was really cool. So anyway, that's everything about lasers. Have a great day.